Well, I'd first like to thank you all for coming out tonight and a uh, cool uh, night that seems to be part of the course for this winter. Um, I, the talk that I, I would like to um, present to you tonight has to do with stress and how that affects your sex drive, your uh, fertility, and I'd like to touch on how the thyroid fits into all of that. If you have any questions, uh, if they're clarification questions, that type of thing as we're going through, then feel free to jump in with those. If it's a question that would like to require a little bit more of an involved answer, we have a question and answer period at the end, so I'd, I'd ask that perhaps if you can uh, reserve those for then, and I'll be happy to answer them then, uh, which I guess this is not one of those. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So we'll, we'll be talking more about that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, there, there's there's a subsection on thyroid here. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm focusing it kind of on on sex drive and fertility because of the, because it's February 13th. Uh, but other, otherwise, uh, you know, a good a good portion of it is is thyroid related. Um, I'd like to start actually actually by asking you all a question. Uh, can I see a show of hands from people that feel like they have stress or they feel like they're having feeling some of the effects of stress? So, yeah. Okay. So I noticed there's a few of you that didn't put your hand up. Uh, so either you're having, some of you may be uh, having some really great stress management techniques and you're managing it well, but I would contend that there's probably a few of you that didn't put your hand up that are feeling some of the effects of stress and you may not even realize it. In this talk, you'll learn what are some of the signs of stress, what stress can do to your health, particularly your thyroid and sexual health, and what are some natural approaches to help you manage some of that stress. Okay, so without further ado, I'd like to start off with a little bit of a joke. Let's see if we can, whoops. Go back. All right. So, uh, in, in case you you can't see that quite, it says Pre preventative medicine kills uh, return business. Okay, it's the first day of medical school. Uh, so uh, the the point here is <laughs> the point here is that preventative medicine is one of the hallmarks of naturopathic medicine. So really, our goal as naturopaths is to prevent illnesses from happening. So eventually, we're we're putting ourselves out of business, so that's really our, our ultimate goal. So just lighten it up a little bit. All right. So how do we know, first of all, if stress is a factor in our health? Well, first of all, just feeling a little bit overwhelmed by just kind of the day-to-day -day things. So little things tend to pile up, and then they, you feel like it's just too much for me to handle. Of course, fatigue, and this can often ca come with caffeine dependence. So if you feel like, well, I just have to have that little bit of a coffee in the morning or it's just, you know, I just can't get through my day, likely you're starting to feel some of the effects of stress. Uh, disturbed sleep, so all kinds of different insomnia, having trouble falling asleep, waking up at various times during the night, particularly if you wake up between that 1 to 3, p, uh, 3 a.m. window, uh, that can often be uh, due to some of the stress hormones and blood sugar management. Anxiety, depression, uh, inability to re relax again without drugs and alcohol, similar to the caffeine, some sort of a stimulant or something to balance out uh, the effects of stress which are affecting the hormones. And of course, low sex drive, uh, as we'll get into a little bit later, uh, some of the stress hormones can start to imbalance the reproductive hormones which can lead to this symptom. And poor temperature regulation, which has to do with the thyroid, which we'll get into a little bit later. It also has to do with other hormones too, but thyroid is the main one there. So if we're, f if we're feeling some of the effects of stress, then maybe there are some more serious health consequences that are already developing, already going on in the body. So high blood pressure and low blood pressure, both of these can be caused by stress. Uh, high blood pressure can happen at the beginnings of the stress response. It can happen later on in the stress response. The lower blood pressure tends to happen as we go along through the stress response. So you don't tend to get that at the beginning, but later on when the body's less able to cope with the stress. Lowered immune system function, 
some of the hormones that are produced in response to stress will actually suppress the immune system and infertility, both male and female, and we'll, again, we'll get into some of the mechanisms with the hormones a bit later. Now, this one here uh, is very important. Uh, menopause slash andropause is you know, the male version of menopause. So normally, if everything's functioning well, your body's handling the stress well, if you're a woman, you're going from hormone levels up here to hormone levels that are lower in this range here. When there's a lot of stress involved, instead of having the hormones like progesterone, estrogen up here and then menopause bringing it here, those levels are more down to here. And that's when you start getting symptoms because there's such a, uh, a gulf between the premenopausal hormone levels and the postmenopausal hormone levels that your body is just having a lot of trouble dealing with it. So in an ideal world, that should not happen. We'll explain a little bit more about that later. And chronic diseases, a lot of these things like allergies, arthritis, asthma, diabetes, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, these are inflammatory conditions that are closely linked to the stress response. And finally, last but not least, thyroid imbalance. Just want to give a little bit of background of what the body does when stress gets in there and how it can lead to some of those conditions I mentioned before. So what the body is trying to do when it's reacting to stress, it's, it's trying to maintain basically a stable environment. So it's this principle of homeostasis. The body's trying to keep itself running in a, sta in a stable, balanced way in the face of external factors that are changing. And two of the systems in the body that are primarily involved in, in doing that are your nervous system and your endocrine or hormonal system. Again, the hormonal stuff is what we're going to be focusing on more in this uh, presentation here. So there's three stages of the stress response. So the initial is, stage is the, the, the short-term stress response or the alarm stage. Okay, this is uh, when the body produces certain hormones to help you deal with the stress there. Um, that if, there, if it's kept a short term, that usually does not cause long-term consequences for the body. It's when it develops into this long-term or resistance stage of the stress response where you start to get into the problems. And then eventually, if that keeps going and it's not dealt with and managed, it can lead to exhaustion. just want to break down the short and the longer term responses to stress a little bit and what are some of the consequences. Okay, so the short term stress response, we also call that the fight or flight response or the alarm stage. So this is where the heart rate will increase, the, uh, the blood pressure will increase. This is, you know, the classic case where, you know, you're being chased down the road by a dog. Okay, so every, your, your heart, your muscles, your lungs, they have to all increase to be able to get you out of that stressful situation. And that is normal for your body to do that. Your blood sugar increases. That increased blood sugar then goes to your brain, to your blood cells, to your muscles, to allow you to deal with the stress. Uh, of course, increased alertness. And this is important. The digestive system, urinary tract, needs to slow down when that's happening. So the body is, re is prioritizing what needs to happen to get you out of that stressful situation. For instance, you, you're being chased down a road by a dog, you don't want to be stopping by the ditch to take a pee. You want, you want to get out of there, okay? So that's, you know, it may be an extreme example of how the body prioritizes uh, certain areas and deprioritizes others. Long-term stress response uh, or that resistance stage. So again, the blood pressure can go up in this situation. The blood sugar will tend to be elevated again by slightly different hormones, but it will be. Um, now, proteins and fats will get broken down in this scenario. Now, that might sound partially good. Well, first of all, breakdown of the proteins is not really a great thing because your body is metabolizing your own muscle, muscle tissue to help it get sugar so that it can actually function. Um, so, but the fat part, you might think on the surface that that's a good thing. But if you actually compare what's going on, the increase in the blood sugar and the breakdown of the fats, the net effect actually uh, over the long term over the long term tends to be that you actually tend to gain fat because the increase in the sugar will actually cause you to make fat and even though you're breaking some of that down the net effect will actually that you'll be accumulating fat and 
Does anyone know where the main area where you tend to accumulate fat is? Yeah. Spare tire. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so you start seeing someone start, this happens in men and women, starts to develop around here, there's a really good chance it has to do with a stress response. And, of course, immune system imbalance, which we'll see a little bit later how that really ties into the health of the thyroid. Okay. Hormones. And how are they involved? So this is going to be extremely important part of the presentation here. Hopefully it'll make some sense about how, how stress can affect the body. Okay, so just give a little bit of a de definition here. Hopefully th these are big enough and I'm more or less going to be reading from here. Um, so hormones, they're produced by endocrine glands and they travel in the blood. That's the definition. So they're little chemicals produced by certain endocrine glands like the thyroid gland the adrenal glands, the ovaries, the testes, the pituitary gland in the brain. These are just some examples. They travel in the blood to other organ systems to target organs. For example, the um, pituitary gland produces a hormone called growth hormone that goes to your muscles, your bones, and causes them to grow. It does other things too, but just one example. So they coordinate the function between the glands and the different organs to, again, again, maintain optimal function and to help the body maintain a stable internal environment in response to changing external factors. These hormones can be very severely um, disrupted by stress, uh, especially if that stress is prolonged. And two of the ones I really want to focus on here are two products of the adrenal glands. One is called cortisol, and the other one is called DHEA. Okay, that's a big long name, which uh, sometimes I can pronounce it, sometimes I can't. So I'm not going to try right here. Uh, but if later on you really want me to pronounce it, I can try. Uh, we'll do that at the end. Um, and so these ones are very important to your stress response, and as we will see, they will lead eventually to disruptions in the levels of estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, and what I haven't mentioned here, which I'll mention later, some of the thyroid hormones. Okay? So this is a little bit of chemistry here. I apologize. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, uh, but I just want to kind of flag a few areas here. In, in fact, literally, I flagged some of the areas. So can anybody see from this what is, um, in my opinion, one of the most important hormones that your body needs to make all this this whole cascade go cholesterol. yeah cholesterol so this is this is a guy that gets demonized by the mainstream media and conventional medicine as an evil being okay it is not it you your body cannot function you cannot survive without cholesterol it makes your vitamin D it makes all of these hormones so we absolutely need cholesterol, some of which you need in the diet. Your, your liver will make some as well, uh, but it tries to keep that level of cholesterol consistent so that you can make these hormones. I want to flag a couple of them here, your cortisol and your DHEA. Again, these are made by the adrenal glands. And you have your major reproductive hormones, progesterone, testosterone, estradiol. That's one of the, the estrogens. There's also estrone and estriol. The progesterone is used to make the testosterone and the estrogens, and the DHEA is also used to make testosterone and the estrogens there. You can also see that the progesterone can go in a different direction. It can go down to this cortisol. So we're going to see how this relationship can be disrupted by stress. In a balanced, kind of well-functioning body, the cortisol should be at a certain level, the testosterone and estrogen should be at a you know, relatively constant level. Uh, it's when they start getting uh, in balance compared to each other that we run into problems. So let's talk a little bit about cortisol and how that uh, can, get, can get involved in the stress response here. So the adrenal glands, you can see in the little diagram there, they're, they're kind of about that big. They're sort of pyramid shaped. You've got two of them, one on top of each kidney, and they produce um, various hormones, including cortisol. 
the cortex region just means the outer part of the adrenal glands. Uh, and it tends to be elevated in conditions of long-term stress. Now, in some cases, when you're getting closer to the exhaustion phase, the cortisol levels can actually drop. And a lot of people, because the cortisol follows a curve over the course of the day, where it tends to be elevated in the morning, and then it goes down a little bit in the afternoon, it comes back up in kind of early evening. Uh, some people can have wild fluctuations. So they can have high cortisol at some times and low at other times, which can really, really wreak havoc on your, on your body. One thing it does in response to the stress is it raises your blood sugar. Now again, under normal conditions and when it's being produced at, at normal levels, the cortisol will not cause an issue here. But if it's constantly being, if your body is constantly forcing itself to make cortisol, you could potentially run into problems of blood sugar management. So increase the risk of diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Okay, diabetes is one of those ones that, you know, it's, it's turning into an epidemic. Yeah? Uh, could this relate also to bipolar? Uh, yeah, well, bipolar and, uh, yeah, and also clinical depression. Yeah, uh, because in my opinion, a lot of that has to do with the blood sugar management. Uh, so if the blood sugar is not well managed, that can make you more susceptible to some of those conditions, um, some of those mood disorders like depression or bipolar disorder. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, and diabetes can also is, is associated with cardiovascular disease, uh, like heart attack and stroke, as those are consequences of cardiovascular disease. Again, suppresses your immune system, uh, primarily by raising your blood sugar, which has an immunosuppressive effect. So like taking a teaspoon of sugar will suppress your immune system for up to eight hours. Uh, so that's why, you know, some of these over-the-counter cold medications are kind of dangerous because you take them, it helps your symptoms a little bit. But you're actually pro prolonging the cold because it's suppressing your immune system and making it harder for it to fight it off. So you can actually, you end up taking that product longer because you, you, you still have the symptoms longer. Yeah? Uh, that, that's a good question. It's mostly related to the blood glucose levels, but um, fructose will actually impair your body's ability to manage the glucose sort of in an indirect way by affecting insulin negatively. So it's not a good idea to replace glucose with fructose. In fact, you know, I recommend people don't eat a lot of fructose to just get it from a small amount of fruit with fiber and not to have fruit juices and, and certainly not beverages that contain, you know, high fructose corn syrup or other sources of fructose, yeah, and or sucrose, which contains 50% fruit, fructose, yeah. Okay, if you remember from the previous slide, when there's a lot of cortisol being produced, which of these hormones do you think may start to suffer? So if we're making a lot of this guy, cortisol, which one of the reproductive hormones is going to start to get lowered? It's progesterone here. So that potentially could lead to a lot of consequences. One, there's less of it that can come over and produce the progesterone in the, in the estrogens. Sorry, the testosterone in the estrogens. And it is not there to carry out the functions that you need the progesterone to do, uh, like maintaining pregnancy, for instance. So this can have a major negative impact on fertility. Eventually, if your adrenal glands are forced to make a lot of this cortisol, can lead to burnout where you're getting, you know, extreme fatigue, lightheadedness, especially if you stand up quickly and you feel dizzy and you get stars, uh, low blood pressure, and poor memory and concentration. Again, this is not an exhaustive list, but these are some of the main ones. That's cortisol. So DHEA, it's going to have some similar functions. Uh, it's also produced by the cortex regions of the adrenal glands. And it's converted, uh, if you remember the previous slide, or two slides ago, converted to testosterone and the estrogens. And it tends to be lowered under conditions of uh, long-term stress. It can lead to impaired immune system function as well. So re recurrent chronic infections, uh, so colds and flus, uh, fungal infections just don't go away. Uh, autoimmune diseases, allergies, and uh, what's often not thought of as a, an immune imbalance, uh, but it absolutely is cancer. Okay.
lowered sex drive, of course, with the reduced testosterone levels and infertility with the lowered estrogens. And again, this imbalance can precipitate menopause and andropause. So cortisol, DHEA, very important hormones in the stress response there. We touched a little bit on how that affects fertility and sex drive. I want to switch gears a little bit here and talk about the thyroid and how that fits in all, into all of this. So let's talk a little bit about the thyroid. What does it do? Uh, first of all, it's the, if you can see the little green gland there, it's just right at the base of the neck. Okay, normally you can't really feel it much. It's just like a soft gland just right about here. Well, one of the main things it does is produce thyroid hormones. There's two major ones, T4 and T3. And now there's, there's longer names here, which I've included. Uh, but for purposes of this, T3 and T4 will do fine. Does anyone know the difference between T3 and T4? Just on, on sorry to ask a chemistry question here, but <laughs> on a chemical level, what's the difference between T3 and T4? Yeah, that's, uh, that thyroxin is the T4, yeah. One more iodine atom. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's the difference, okay? Iodine. Yeah, so the, the T4 has how many iodines? Four. Four. The T3 has three. three. Okay, now that might sound like a trivial difference, but actually for the body, it's huge. And we'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, so this, this relationship is very important. Uh, most of that T3, well, first of all, T3 is made manufactured from T4. So the thyroid itself makes the T4. A little bit of that, about 20% of it, then gets converted into T3. The rest of the T3 is made outside of the thyroid gland, in the liver, the kidneys, uh, some of the other tissues. So this is, this is an important conversion that needs to take place at the correct rate, or things can start to get out of balance. Uh, just to bring in some of the other parts of the thyroid system here, uh, the T4 itself is secreted by the thyroid gland in response to a, another hormone called TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, which is made by the pituitary gland. So if any of you have had your thyroid numbers checked, the most common one that your doctor will use to evaluate, evaluate your thyroid is TSH. So it's actually not made by the thyroid, it's actually a pituitary hormone. The way it works is that if your TSH is you know, within normal range, then they usually consider your thyroid to be okay, even though it might not be. If the TSH is higher than the reference range, then usually they will assume that the thyroid itself is underactive. If the TSH is lower than the reference range, then it will usually be considered that the thyroid is overactive. Okay, in most cases. In some cases, the doctors will investigate it a little bit more. In many cases, they will just medicate you with a certain medication to get the TSH back into line. But as you will see, that's not usually adequate. Okay, uh, so T4 and T3. Both of them have the overall function of controlling the rate at which we burn fuel. So how quickly we're going to burn sugar, uh, primarily glucose, to create energy, to create uh, the ability for chemical reactions to occur in the body and to generate heat. The heat is there to allow these chemical reactions to occur at the right rate. If we don't have enough heat in the body, then everything slows down. T3 is about four to five times more active, more potent in stimulating that metabolism compared to T4. So if you have a whole bunch of T4 and not enough T3, everything's going to slow down because it's just, it's not enough to, to keep your metabolism up. If you have enough T3, then you're good to go. So it's this conversion between T4 and T3, which is absolutely critical to proper thyroid function, which has an effect on fertility and other things, which we'll talk about. Yeah. Oh. Just got to take a quick pause to change batteries here. <laughs> commercial. Yeah, commercial. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> YouTube. Um, yeah. <laughs>
back a little bit later. You can you can put your name and email address if you have one, and we'll send you a PDF copy of it. If you okay, thanks. Uh, I don't have any links to get. Okay. Um, Okay, so T3, T4, that balance is, T4, T3 balance is absolutely critical to proper uh, metabolism and proper function of the, the thyroid and really the whole body. So I want to talk about how stress can affect the thyroid and again, uh, specifically how that can then lead to issues with fertility and, and or you know, lowered sex drive. Autoimmune thyroiditis. Autoimmune, basically, that means it's a general term for a, an inappropriate immunological reaction of your body's own immune system to the body itself. Okay? Um, there's many examples of that. There's uh, multiple sclerosis, uh, lupus, uh, Sjogren syndrome, uh, scleroderma. There's, there's many uh, Crohn's disease. There are many examples. One of the most common is thyroiditis. So this is an inflammation of what? The thyroid. The thyroid, okay? Caused by your own immune system. This can happen when, over time, you start to get reduced levels of cortisol and DHEA. Okay, this will start to increase your risk of autoimmune conditions, like thyroiditis. Hashimoto's thyroiditis is one type uh, where the thyroid it usually uh, ends up being a hypothyroid situation where your thyroid will eventually get underactive, but it can sometimes start off as the opposite where, you're, where the thyroid's overactive or hyperthyroid. Graves' disease is more of a hyper or overactive thyroid situation. Hashimoto's is more common than Graves. Uh, and it's often either undiagnosed or it's just kind of ignored because most endocrinologists, will, everyone that I've ever seen, uh, doesn't treat Hashimoto's thyroiditis. They will treat the, co the consequent hypothyroidism that results from it by trying to manage the TSH levels by giving medication. But they, you, they, I've never seen an endocrinologist treat thyroiditis before. Uh, so really the problem there is that, okay, you might be managing the TSH levels. Maybe the person is doing somewhat okay. But you're not dealing with the thyroiditis. Uh, the problem is just never going to go away until you deal with that part of it. So this is just an important point I just wanted to make there. Uh, it, again, it's common, and it's a common cause of an underactive thyroid or hypothyroidism. And that's, again, when the thyroid itself is not able to make enough of that T4, you, that's when you will end up with a hypothyroidism or underactive thyroid. And this condition, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, has been shown in studies to be associated with infertility. If you think about it, if you're not able to make enough of those thyroid hormones, metabolism slows down, the reproductive cells aren't able to reproduce at the right rate, uh, they're not able to function, and you know, fertility is just you know, impaired or just impossible at that point. Okay, there's another condition of the thyroid which I mentioned earlier. Uh, which I have uh, some training in, called Wilson's Temperature Syndrome. This can coexist with hypothyroidism uh, that is caused by thyroiditis, and I've e even seen it coexist with hyperthyroidism or overactive thyroid. You may have heard of people that have a combination of overactive and underactive thyroid symptoms. Okay, like they feel kind of agitated all the time. Uh, they, they feel like their body temperature is up. Uh, their heart rate might be up, but actually your, their body temperature is low, they're, in, they're gaining weight, uh, their, their skin is getting dry. It's a combination of both symptoms. And often, it's this issue going on on top of the hyperthyroidism. Yeah, question? 
Oh, okay, sorry. Okay, so it was discovered by a doctor in, um, in the U.S. in Florida, Dr. Dennis Wilson. Um, uh, no relation to the Beach Boys there. Uh, in, in the late 1980s. And uh, it's, it's a condition that's like th hypothyroidism itself. It's more common in women, about 80%. And it tends to be high in people of Irish or First Nations descent. It is a condition of a poor thyroid system function characterized by um, a persistent, maladaptive, stress-related, usually reversible condition, um, or impairment, I should say, of the conversion of T4 into T3. So your body might actually be overproducing T4 in response to a hyperthyroid thyroiditis, but it's not able to convert it efficiently into T3, and you start to get this Wilson's temperature syndrome. The reaction that takes place, T4 to T3, is catalyzed or kind of sped up by an enzyme. It's called 5' diiodinase. What it does is it takes one of the iodines in a particular spot on the T4, and it removes it, converts it into T3. Okay? So that's normally what happens. That enzyme is a selenium-containing enzyme, so it requires enough selenium in the body. Important mineral. Elevated cortisol is, uh, again, this is a consequence of a prolonged stress in the early stages, will actually impair that conversion. It will actually make it harder for you to make T3 from the T4. It, what it will do, it will force the T4, it, 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 it wants to go somewhere, it wants to get made into something. So it gets made into something similar called reverse T3. Now reverse T3 is, if you looked at the actual, the written out chem, chemical formula of it, it would look identical to the T3. But in a three-dimensional um, structure of it, it's actually different. The iodine is removed in a different spot, and that makes a world of difference. The, the reverse T3 is inactive. It actually does not stimulate your metabolism like, like the T3. But what it will do is it will interfere with the action of the T3. The T3 itself won't be able to work as well as a metabolic stimulant, and it will actually cause this enzyme that converts T4 into T3 to mess up, so it's not able to make that conversion, so it makes it even harder to make T3. So it's harder to make T3, and the T3 that you do have doesn't work as well. So if you start building up this reverse T3, you can run into trouble. Yeah? Um, when you were talking about the Hashimoto's, you know, yeah. they don't really pay to, you know, to get supplements or whatever, yeah. wouldn't that be they would have to go directly to correcting the autoimmune system? That that that's th yeah, that's that's what we need to do. And yeah, if we, people ever do that? Because it doesn't seem the other autoimmune diseases are really corrected in any way. How are they making out by going directly to the autoimmune? Have they really they're not, done anything? They're like not that? being dealt with very well with conventional medicine, I'll agree with you there. Yeah. Okay. But with naturopathic medicine, I find there's really good success with so autoimmune conditions. Thing, yeah. Do you know of what they do directly to the autoimmune with yeah, because uh, because we, I, I do it. Yeah, and yeah. So what that's you do. So you yeah. have to take the people off the supplements, or what would you do there? If they're on a medication through their doctor, I'm I'm. It's not as a naturopath. I would never say go off that medication. No. I would say, you know, have that discussion with your doctor. This may be causing a an issue where it's actually making it more difficult for your system to heal uh, until you either lower or go off the medication. Uh, and in that case, then that would be a discussion that they would have with their doctor. But I, I can get into it a little bit more later. But uh, there, but you're absolutely right. We need to get to the un, the underlying cause, which in this case is is the autoimmune condition. Otherwise, the thyroid's never going to never going to rebalance itself. Okay, um, low T3 and high reverse T3 can lead to infertility again by not providing enough of that T3 hormone to the reproductive cells. So just the last point on the thyroid here, uh, the WTS, Wilson's Temperature Syndrome. So if, how do we diagnose this? It's something that is not, I mean, it's not really, it's not well known within the conventional med medical realm. And um, so it's something that's obviously missed a lot. It's not diagnosed by conventional blood tests. Uh, now, blood tests, they, they have their place. The, we, we definitely want to run the TSH, the free T3, and the free T4. We want to check for antibodies as well. Um, often we want to run the reverse T3 too. And in many cases, 
with doctors will run, they'll, they'll either just run the TSH or they'll run the TSH with, with the T4 or T3. And in most cases with WTS, these are all normal. So you may have experienced this where you, you suspected that you had some thyroid symptoms and you may have had a problem with your thyroid. You've gone to see your doctor about it. They said, okay, well, let's run some tests. These all come up normal. It's not your thyroid. Don't know what it is. Or, you know, maybe you need an antidepressant. Um, <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, that, that's pretty common. Yeah, the, this is the thing happened to me. Yeah. I checked uh, so many times the doctor, every time the doctor said, if you have depression, that's why you are feeling like that. That's right, yeah. So that unfortunately happens all too often. So I, if someone comes in, and I've, it's happened to me a lot where people come into my office and give them a similar story. And, um, and yeah, we don't leave it at that. I mean, okay, there may be some depression going on there, but that could very well be a consequence of... The, of the thyroid imbalance, which we need to really look into beyond just these numbers. So with, with WTS, one of the best ways to check it is by tracking your body temperature. The way to do it is by checking it actually three times a day at three hour intervals. And we're looking for, uh, if you want the specifics of that, I can give that at the end, okay? Um, we're looking for an average temperature of 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 37 degrees Celsius. Okay, there's two reasons why we use Fahrenheit. One is because Dr. Wilson is American, and and secondly is because the Fahrenheit scale is a little bit better for oral temperature because it actually has more numbers over that scale, so it's a little bit easier to you know to use the graduations there rather than having to do you know thirty six point seven five or something like that. Is oral the okay? best way to do it? Yeah. Okay. Actually, oral is the most closely approximates the core temperature. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Even even better than axillary. Okay. Yeah. But you have to be a little careful with it because if you just drank a hot drink or, you know, you just drank a cold drink, I usually recommend, like, wait 10 minutes before you check your oral temperature. Okay? Uh, just, there's some signs and symptoms that are also uh, very important at which can point to the WTS. Uh, of course, fatigue, weight gain. Uh, there's various other ones, low libido. Uh, some physical signs like the thinning outer third of the eyebrows. Okay? Um, delayed Achilles reflex return. So what that means is your Achilles tendon on the back of your ankle, um, if you hit it with a little reflex hammer, your foot is going to go like this. Okay? It's, gonna, it's going to dorsiflex. It's going to go down like that. Um, sorry, plantar flex. And normally what happens, it, you hit it, the foot goes down, and then it immediately snaps back into the neutral position. But if you have WTS or lowered thyroid function, it's going to do this. It's going to snap down and then it's going to come back slowly. Okay? Yeah. Uh, it's just hanging over the end of the table kind of thing. So it's just like that. Okay? And then what we do is we just, as a physician, we just lift up the foot a little bit, tap the back of the Achilles tendon, and your foot should go like this. Okay? Some muscle memory is the problem. Muscle memory? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's part of it. And in fact, often I'll see someone that... Um, if, if the thyroid function is low, they won't even have that reflex. They'll just, it, the foot will just stay like that. Okay, yeah. And I checked I check the, um, the patellar tendon here, the knee reflex, uh, to see if that moves. And a lot, a lot of people with WTS, that, that doesn't really move much either. There's associated conditions that are directly or indirectly caused by WTS, like for depression. We mentioned uh, fibrocystic breast disease. There's many cystic diseases like you know, ovarian cysts um, as well that will, like PCOS, that can be associated with thyroid imbalance and low iodine levels, which also contributes to thyroid imbalance. Uh, irritable bowel syndrome and, of course, infertility. And we also want to look at things like candida, which is a fungus that can overgrow in the body, parasites, and heavy metal toxicities, because these can coexist with the thyroid imbalance, and they can, often the symptoms are similar. So we want to rule those out, whether it's just a problem with these other issues or if it, it's a combination of them. All right. So now that we know about all these imbalances here, what are some things that we can do about it? Of course, this is general, general recommendations. Not everyone will benefit from these, but for many people, some of these changes can go a long way to help rebalance uh, the system. I uh, wanted to ask a quick question. Anybody know what this is? Berries. Yeah, they're berries. Anyone know what cotton berries? 
yeah, camu berry, okay, from South America. The very high, excellent source, non-GMO source of what? Vitamin C. Vitamin C, okay? Sorry, what was it? Vitamin C. Vitamin C. Camu. camu berry, camu berry. Sometimes called camu camu. C-A-M-U. Yeah. Yeah, the, the big carrot dispensary has, has a lot of it. Okay. Um, the other one, I, I think most people know what kind of nut that is. Brazil, Brazil nut. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, we're going to get to that, but uh, is it selenium? yeah, it's uh, the highest food source of selenium. Yeah. Okay. Avoidance of caffeine. Caffeine, what it does, it goes to your adrenal glands. It tells your adrenal glands to make cortisol, and then that cortisol starts wreaking havoc on your body. Okay. So when you get into the coffee cycle. Uh, the coffee, you're having it because your cortisol levels are a little low in the morning because you're feeling the effects of stress, and then you're forcing the cortisol to get elevated, and then that just keeps the ball rolling. Yeah? You just mentioned too that it dehydrates you instead of thrives you, and also interferes with the mineral stimulation. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, yeah, the, the list is probably this long, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and then that makes you less able to cope with the stressful situations. Yeah, cocoa, absolutely. Yeah, it does. It has less. Like raw cacao will have a little bit of caffeine. Like one cup of coffee? Even even one cup of coffee. Yeah, everyone's everyone's different. Some people, uh, you know, have I have some patients in my practice that you know they drink like six cups of coffee a day, and then obviously we get them to work on that, right? Uh, but you know that may have the same stimulating effect on them as one cup for somebody else. And some people say, well, I only drink one cup of coffee a day. It's 65 to 130 milligrams of caffeine. That is a lot. That will, that will have some physiological effect on the body. And it will, uh, for many people, it will really start the ball rolling for this imbalance. Yeah. Yeah. What about the caffeine in tea? Yeah. Well, that's a good question. That can do it too for some people. It's less. It's probably less than half of the caffeine that a cup of coffee will have. But it, that can be enough to do it. Even decaf. Because decaf does have caffeine in it. And it's just less. Well, yeah, it's, it's usually around 15 milligrams as opposed to like 65 again to 130 for a cup of coffee. Okay. Why does, why does coffee get worse reaction? Because some people have like 16 a day. So that's yeah, yeah, that's right. And, and that, that, that'll cause the same problem. Yeah, yeah. And, and coffee does have some benefits. I mean, sir, sure, there's antioxidants in it. But the way I look at that is, well, you know, you can take a baby aspirin or you can take a little bit of garlic. Uh, they're both going to have anticoagulant effects, which you know can help with uh, cardiovascular disease, but you're going to get a lot of negatives with the uh, baby aspirin, the, the garlic, you know, except for some people that are sensitive to it. The garlic. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so it's it's one of those situations where yeah, you'll get some benefits. You know, when you you read especially this time of year how healthy chocolate is. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, in small amounts, it it can be okay for some people, and it does have benefits, but it does have some potential drawbacks for some people. And uh, so, in my opinion, there's a lot of other things you can do. You can get a lot of similar benefits that you don't get the drawbacks. Okay, but we can get into that a little bit more at the end if you have any specific questions. Um, sugar, this will imbalance the immune system. If your sugar starts getting out of balance where it's getting low at certain times, it will force your body to make cortisol to get the sugar back up. And then you're, you're jacking up your cortisol again, and that's causing some of the hormonal imbalances. Um, regular small meals can help keep the sugar stable to prevent that. Essential fatty acids, or EFAs. This one I've bolded because it has a direct impact on fertility, but it will also have a general benefit to your, um, your hormonal balance. Uh, vitamins A, C, D, uh, E, and many of the B vitamins. Uh, again, a lot of these have direct impacts, uh, benefits to fertility. Coenzyme Q10. This one is extremely important for functioning pretty much all of your cells. Uh, any of cells that use oxygen, which are most of the cells in your body, require this coenzyme Q10. If, if you are on a statin type of cholesterol lowering drug, it's going to deplete your coenzyme Q10 levels. Yeah? Now what food is having, is it in a certain food? Or? Yeah, it's in, uh, it's in uh, some foods, like uh, some seafoods will have it, but it's difficult to get in therapeutic doses. I mean, if, if you're very low in coenzyme Q10, Usually you have to, at least for a period of time, do a supplement to get the levels back up. And then, you know, once it's balanced, and as long as you're not taking a medication that, that depletes it, uh, you can, you know, usually maintain it through the diet. 
Uh, minerals, iron, you know, particularly good for um, for fertility, and magnesium, manganese, and zinc. Yeah. Back to auto, autoimmune Hashimoto's. Yes. It's being said that iodine is not good for the autoimmune thyroid problems. Is that so? Um, I I would I would say that um, it, that's not the case in in, in every instance. So you can, in many cases where, where there is thyroiditis, there's actually depleted iodine levels, and there's ways you can check that. Uh, so supplementing with iodine in many of those cases can actually be beneficial, but you have to be a little careful. If there is a, a thyroiditis situation, like Hashimoto's or, or Graves' disease, you don't want to over-supplement with iodine because it potentially could throw the person into a hyperthyroid situation. So you have to be cautious with it. Um, but it can be very helpful for many people. And I actually, I have recommended iodine or, um, or formulas that contain iodine for people with Hashimoto's, but we, you have to be more cautious with it. Yeah, so it's a good point. Would health be better than taking an iodine? It depends. Like it de iodine well, therapy. it's a good question. It depends on what, you know, how severe the iodine deficiency is. If it's very severe, you, you might have to, you might have to eat like you know, half a pound of kelp every day to get your levels up and it's just not realistic, right? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, in some cases, supplementation with an iodine supplement is just a better way to go. But as a maintenance, yeah, the kelp can be really great. Yeah. Yeah. I was writing, did you mention how you test for iodine deficiency? I didn't mention it, but you know what? I'll save that to the end and I can get into that a little bit. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thyroid support, uh, we, iodine, of course, selenium, very important. Uh, not only is it a important part of the, the enzymes that, uh, that convert T4 into T3. It uh, actually, um, it's associated with, if your selenium levels are low, it's been associated with an increased risk of thyroiditis. So it actually can help you uh, get those thyroiditis levels, you know, under control uh, by supplementing with, with selenium. So that, that, to answer your earlier question, that's one of the things that I'll often recommend to help rebalance the, the thyroiditis. Yeah. Well, um, in general, uh, it's, it, it's, there's not an interaction there. But, you know, I always recommend if you're going to take a supplement, you're on medication, have that discussion with your doctor. Everyone's a little bit different. Every supplement, potentially, a person could have a sensitivity to. Uh, I mean, there's not a theoretical interaction there negatively, but it's always a good idea to have that discussion with your doctor. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And iodine. iodine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I think that's a major contributing factor. In, in fact, that can, um, in my opinion, kind of predispose you to a thyroiditis because your, your um, thyroid will start to produce a lot of um, a, a protein kind of globule called thyroglobulin, which tracks the iodine. So when you do that, you produce a lot of that. It makes it more likely that your immune system is going to start negatively reacting to that. Okay, uh, nutrition. So these are some herbal formulas or er herbs that can help manage uh, the, these imbalances. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's actually, um, I had it. Yeah, I had it there. Yeah, you want me to speak on that a little bit? Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's right. Uh, tyrosine is the thyroid hormone, T4 and T3, is a tyrosine based um, hormone. Okay, so it's not. It's not made from cholesterol. It's made from basically two of these tyrosine amino acids stuck together. And so you can get tyrosine from your food, protein-containing foods. Uh, but when you get it from protein-containing foods, you're getting tyrosine with a lot of other amino acids. So if the tyrosine's low, it's not always the most efficient way to get it in if you need to get it up. So you can actually get supplements that have tyrosine or thyroid formulas that contain tyrosine to help you make more of the, of the T4 and T3 hormones. Okay, so thanks for reminding me. Um, yeah, herbal medicine. Uh, so there's a really good class of herbs called adaptogens. They help the body adapt to stress, primarily by modulating the adrenal glands. But some of them are excellent because uh, that I've flagged here because they, they either also benefit the thyroid or they have a direct benefit to uh, fertility. This ashwagandha, 
Uh, this is a really excellent herb for for uh, adrenal gland balance and for thyroid balance. Uh, cordyceps is an excellent one, energy providing and uh, also excellent for fertility. And maca is similar to that too. Uh, in fact, that's the maca there. Okay, this is a, uh, a cruciferous root, which is from, um, yeah, from Peru and, and uh, South America. Anyone know what that herb is over on the passion flower? Yeah, okay, it's pretty cool. And this falls in the class of nervines. This is a nervous system balancing set of herbs, which are very good. When you balance your, the nervous system, it takes some pressure off the endocrine system. Uh, and again, thyroid support, kelp, okay, which was mentioned. Uh, Google is another uh, herb which can help with that. And blue flag is uh, the botanical scientific name for that is iris versicolor. That's what this guy is here. We go back to the beginning, that big iris there. Okay, blue, blue flag was actually traditionally used uh, even in Western medicine to treat both, um, to treat goiter, so both, uh, which is enlargement of your thyroid, which can be due to both hyper and hypothyroid situations. So it actually is bidirectional. It actually can help with both hyper and hypothyroidism. So it's really, it's a great herb. Some other naturopathic therapies. Blue flag? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So homeopathy, again, this is very symptom specific, depends on the individual. Uh, there are some homeopathic preparations uh, that are made from, from thyroid, uh, which can sometimes be, you know, balancing to uh, the person depending on their needs. With acupuncture, uh, we're looking at balancing the flow of chi or energy, particularly with the kidneys. If you're talking about fertility uh, or uh, stress response in general, the kidney energy tends to get imbalanced. So the, the chi or the, the energy of the kidneys as well as the essence, which is basically the ability to reproduce. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Because yeah, Exactly, yeah. Yeah, and, and yeah. And if you get low back pain or you suffer from knee pain a lot, it, those, those are some symptoms that the kidneys are out of balance. But yeah, the, ear, the ears, they're connected to your kidneys. They get cold a lot or if you have ringing in your ears. Uh, which is interesting because uh, tinnitus or ear ringing is also associated with uh, thyroid imbalance too. Mm -hmm. I yeah. have a question. If somebody has like from me to with, uh, too much cold all the time, like cold? Yeah. Yeah. Looks what, feel like water running in the like swelling. Water running down. Yeah. Okay. Or we are standing on the eyes. That's what it feels like. Yeah. yeah. Um, so like if you have a lot of cold in the legs, it feels like water running down. Uh, you're asking what that's related to? Well, I mean, if you have cold extremities in general, that can absolutely be related to the thyroid. But there may be other issues too, circulation, poor lymphatic flow, where you're, you're building up extra fluid, and so you have decreased circulation, which can sometimes lead to the cold as well. But when, when I see someone with cold extremities, their hands and feet get cold easily, then I immediately suspect thyroid. Again, we put that into the picture of everything. Yeah, um, and lifestyle, of course, you know, some of this is pretty obvious, you know, exercise, meditation, breathing techniques, making sure you're getting ad adequate rest. I mean, in general, I like to recommend people to sleep between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. Um, you know, not everyone can do that, you know, if they're working certain shifts or, you know, for other reasons, but, um, you know, ideally, for most people, I find that works the best. And in some cases, with counseling, if there's issues with, um, of course, anxiety or, or depression. Yeah. People, you know, sleep is a big issue. Yeah. So can you elaborate a bit more on sleep? Um, as far as the thyroid Yeah, I can. Um, I, I'm going to ask if maybe we can leave that to the end, and then yeah, we'll get into that. Okay. Um, so some things to consider when we're managing the stress to benefit the thyroid and to benefit fertility, of course. Uh, we want to address any associated health conditions. Uh, so if Stress is causing low thyroid function, either WTS or other issues like thyroiditis. We need to identify that, of course. Uh, diabetes or, you know, what precedes diabetes is what we call dysglycemia. or just the imbalance in blood sugar. So sometimes people will get something like hypoglycemia, where they feel they don't eat for a while, they get a little bit tired, or they, they feel lightheaded, or they get headaches, or they get cranky. Uh, this can be, these can be symptoms of hypoglycemia, which with some people can be a, an initial sign 
and eventually they can end up with diabetes. Cardiovascular issues, again, this ties into diabetes very closely. Heavy metal toxicity, we want to check that out. It's fairly common. Mercury can actually be one that can interfere with the thyroid hormones. Um, digestive disturbances, food intolerances. If you have a weakened digestive system, which can happen uh, because of stress, and it can also be uh, worsened by a thyroid imbalance, you have trouble digesting your food. The food then becomes fodder for bad bacteria and fungus in your gut, which then creates inflammation, which can, then can lead to inflammatory conditions in your body, including thyroiditis. So, you know, this all can, can, you can trace this all back to stress often. And, of course, can, candida and parasites, these are other factors you want to look into. Remember, everybody's different. You know, one, one remedy that might work for one person may not work for another. And remember that natural remedies, they can help with both treatment and prevention. So, again, prevention is that kind of pinnacle. That's where we really want to get to um, ultimately. Just a last uh, message here. Uh, by supporting your, the individual's ability to manage life stress, so really by helping the body to rebalance itself, uh, naturopathic medicine is really trying to help you back on that road to health. Okay, thank you.